Greetings and welcome back to 303 in Junior English. We turn now in our hymnal to page 725, and we are now looking at the third of our three Imagist poets. Now, we've already studied Ezra Pound, we've already studied William Carlos Williams, and we now turn to H.D., short for Hilda Doolittle, right? Okay. We are going to turn to one offering by her called Pear Tree. This is one of her more famous Imagist poems. Now, let's just remind ourselves really quickly about Imagist poetry. We are looking for the most simple, direct path to provide a powerful word picture, an image, if you will, so that the senses, what you can see, what you can taste, what you can hear, etc., etc., are going to be educated directly. That's our goal. Let's take a look now at this text, Pear Tree, and let's go ahead and read it. Now, as we said in earlier lectures on William Carlos Williams, for example, reading images poetry helps you to read images poetry. So, some of the work that we've already done will help us as we get ready to read this one. Let's take a look at it, shall we? Pear Tree. I'm on page 725. Pear Tree. Silver dust lifted from the earth higher than my arms reach. You have mounted, oh, silver, higher than my arms reach. You front us with great mass. No flower ever opened so staunch a white leaf. No flower ever parted silver from such rare silver. Oh, white pear, your flower tufts thick on the branch bring summer and ripe fruits in their purple hearts. Now let's turn and let's just ask a couple of quick observations. Now you've noticed that often in our conversations, one of the first places we start is at level 2B. Not what the poet says, but how the poet says it, that rhetorical level of reading. Let's go ahead and scan this poem really quickly and identify a couple of things we can write down in our notes at 2B. For example, notice how many stanzas we have in this poem. Did you see that? Notice the interesting line breaks, right? You have this ability, for example, for a line to continue from line one to line two, so that you would read it as silver dust lifted from the earth, right? But you got the break after the word dust, don't you? Notice that we don't have any kind of real rhyme scheme going on here, but every once in a while we'll have, for example, the word silver at line 10 and the word silver at line 11 ending. Do you see that, right? Okay. Let's now turn to the poem itself at level one. A very simple title, Pear Tree, which tells us this is going to be an imagist poem about a pear tree, right? Now that's significant because, for example, remember, in the William Carlos Williams offering, The Great Figure, we didn't have any idea from the title what really was going on until we'd read the poem. Here, we are reading, in many ways, a celebration of a pear tree. Now, about that, we are going to ask, what are the primary images that are, that are played with? What are the senses that are elicited? So let's go ahead and just play the game really quickly as we work along. Of course, silver here is going to be playing with color. Pear trees, of course, have that shimmery white color when they're in full bloom, as the picture on page 725 suggests. Silver dust lifted from the earth. Let's go ahead and just pause for a moment at level one and ask, what's kind of cool about suggesting that a tree is like silver dust lifted from the earth, right? Now, of course, we understand that what the poet is just saying is that the tree grows out of the earth, right? Grows into the sky. But notice there's this kind of really interesting idea that the top of the tree somehow lifts off the ground, right? Like it's almost like a, a, a spaceship or something leaving the ground, an object flying, right? The verb lifted is an interesting verb higher than my arms can reach, which is significant, of course, because the speaker of the poem doesn't necessarily have to be an adult. It could be a child who is trying to do what? Reach up 
and grab for one of the pears, right, from the tree and can't quite reach it, right? You have mounted. So this, again, the word lifted and the word mounted, to mount is literally the verb uh, that a bird, when a bird takes and jumps, right, to mount, off, off one goes, right? Oh, silver, back to the word at the beginning of the poem. Higher than my arms can reach. Notice it's almost like a mantra. It's almost like a song with a, with a verse coming back. You front us with great mass. Notice the interesting two things about line uh, seven. This use of the verb front, that is to say to confront, that is to say challenge, maybe for your notes you might write it down that way. The word front here can actually mean challenge. With great mass. Of course, the word mass here is an interesting word because in religious terms, the word mass in Catholic terms means a religious experience, a religious service, right? You go to mass if you are a Catholic practitioner, right? Of course, mass also here can mean large size, great mass, large size. So in other words, what is emphasized in the first stanza? Go ahead and write it down at level one. What specifically is emphasized about the amazing nature of trees? Trees in general, we obviously have Ruthie's tree that we often reference right outside our window here. What's kind of amazing about trees? Many students have pointed out. When you think about it, there's something really incredible about trees. The way in which the, the, the top of the tree, right, just seems to kind of spring out of the ground when it's, you know, in full bloom right? The large mass. The silver being emphasized twice here most likely is the color, right? Although sometimes silver, as the word is used, can elicit some referencing to money or something like that, right? Notice we continue. Second stanza. No flower ever opened so staunch a white leaf. No flower ever parted silver from such rare silver. Note the genius of what HD is doing here, the, the game that she's playing. She starts with silver in relationship to color, and she turns to silver in relationship to currency, money, value. In other words, go ahead and write down in your notes at level one, what is it that she says about this tree and about the flowers of the pear tree in full bloom, right? As it relates to wealth. Now, this is a very romantic intuition. The imagists borrowed heavily from those romantics. Certainly, Walt Whitman comes to mind as celebrating what is of greatest value. What is of greatest value is not always understood to be what is of monetary value, right? But what is of greatest value in terms of encouraging one's aesthetic tendencies, beauty, the capacity to go, whoa, that's compelling. She says, such rare silver. We're back in the third stanza, notice for the second time, with the letter O, which is going to be interesting. O, silver, and now O, white, pear, right? This O immediately makes us think, of course, doesn't it, of the poetry of Walt Whitman, who loves to use this O when he is constantly in celebratory mode, and he's in that mode a lot in Leaves of Grass, right? We're celebrating this tree. Of course, it makes sense to say O for a number of other reasons as well. O is often our response to seeing something amazing. Oh, right? But of course, pears as well have a certain kind of O shape. See? So HD is playing interesting games with us once we start paying closer attention. Oh, white pear, your, now notice, speaking directly to the tree. We've seen this from the first stanza on, right? The Romantics will do this in the form of odes and apostrophes where you direct, speak directly to an inanimate object as if somehow a tree can, you know, read a poem or be, you know, complimented and, you know, kind of like it or whatever, right? Oh, white pear, your flower tufts, that's an interesting hyphened word, right? Thick on the branch, bring summer and ripe fruits in their purple hearts. 
Now, the, let's, let's finish uh, the third stanza by making a couple of observations. Notice what she says literally at level one. Reduce it in your own words at level one to what it is that she says. When the tree is in full bloom, that is an indication that we are now into summer. Hurrah. Many of us thinking that's the funnest time of the year, right? Notice that she says that the flowers on the branch bring summer. Now, what's ironic about this? What do we know about the ways the seasons work? Flowers don't bring summer, but what? Right, summer brings flowers, right? Spring, summer brings flowers. So notice the inversion of the natural order here. In other words, she's giving this tree credit for bringing summer. Well, of course, technically, that may not be the case, but oftentimes, symbolically, it's the case that when we, for example, are getting to the end of a spring school year and we're getting very excited for summer, one of the things that indicates it's summer quickly coming is all the trees start leaving out, right? And the large number of trees on a branch tell us, somehow tell us, that summer is now here. Late spring, early summer is now here. Ripe fruits of course, a reference to the pear itself in their purple hearts. Now, this purple hearts thing is a very interesting way to end the poem. Jot down in your notes what's significant about calling the center of either the pear or the center of the tree purple hearts. Of course, if you've eaten a pear lately, you will note that you get to the core of the pear, like the core of an apple, right? And it does have a certain kind of color for the seed and that kind of thing, which is usually a brown or a purple color. What's significant, though, about the word heart? That is significant, of course, because the word heart often has two meanings, doesn't it? A physical organ, the center of the either the, the body or, of course, the pair, physically. But heart also carries with it the connotations of life source. Life source. So that the tree is being celebrated for its capacity to give life. Okay? Now, of course, if we were to jump really quickly to uh, level two, we could identify major themes here as being a celebration of life, a celebration of the spring summer and the bringing of life and spring summer by trees. We could say that this has a romantic insight as well, that nature is way beyond monetary value, the capacity to enjoy the, the force and the dynamism of nature. At level 3A, we've already mentioned at 2B already some of the observations here. Obviously, we could ask the about at 2B the symbolism in play here, right? The pear tree symbolizes any number of things, right? Dynamic growth, the joy of summer. The idea of the purple hearts is a powerful image, another symbol we could say. At level 3, we've got all kinds of references at 3A we could make to other texts, don't we? Right? For example, we can ask about Ezra Pound's don't essay, right? A few don'ts, uh, about what makes imagist poetry imagist poetry. And we could ask, does this poem qualify as an imagist poem? And if so, why? Clearly it does qualify, and it's a powerful snapshot image <coughs> of a tree. You look at the tree, and all of a sudden it's like, wow, it's so beautiful. But then you can experience somehow the power of the tree through a poem like this of soliciting all kinds of senses as well, where you can see, taste, smell, etc. We should also point out at 3A that this poem reads, as we've already said, like some very important transcendentalist voices that we've already covered. Um, we think immediately of Whitman, but we also should think of Emerson and his classic essay, uh, Nature, and his celebration of nature, personified often by Emerson and, of course, Thoreau as well. Finally, at 3B, we can ask any number of questions about how you can relate personally to a title like this. Let me, let me help you do this right now as you take notes at 3B. For example, watch this game. What is, for you, your favorite tree? And why? Now, the way you answer that question will have a lot to do with how much you pay attention. I've had juniors that have to answer and say, 
you know, I really don't, I don't know that I paid that much attention to trees. What do you mean my favorite tree? You mean like, do I like what, like an oak tree versus a, you know, an aspen? Is that what you're asking me? Well, that's one way to say it. But no, I'm actually being very specific now. Do you have a tree in your life? A tree that you can actually reference. A tree that you, for example, maybe watched as you grew up. It grew up. I was asking this, this question a while ago, and a student said, you know what, that's funny you would ask that, because when I was a little kid, our elementary school went to a park and planted a tree. And now that you think about it, I've been to that park a number of times over the years, and guess what? When I planted that tree as a little kid, you could jump over that tree. Ain't nobody jumping over that tree now because it's grown. Well, that's kind of fascinating because I hadn't thought about that. In some ways, that tree was a way for me to measure my own growing up. Now, if you've lived in the same house for a long time, it's very possible that this is the case. That when you were young, you can remember somebody planting a tree in the front of the backyard, and now that come to think of it, that tree is still there. It's just now a whole lot bigger than it once was, just like me. Hmm. For some of us, our favorite tree is at a park that we went to many times when we were ch children or growing up. For others of us, maybe our favorite tree is in a show, in a movie that we saw, right? Think about your, um, you know, your, your uh, experiences with trees. Let's ask another question. What's your favorite fruit? What's your favorite fruit tree? Do you have one? Have you ever seen a pear tree? Can you relate to this poem in that way? Or how about this? When was the last time you had an experience in nature where you kind of looked at it and went, oh, back to the use of the word oh, oh, by the way, back to 3A really quickly. Of course, um, we always think of Wordsworth's little poem, my heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. The idea that you can look at something in nature and go immediately, oh, that's so beautiful. And it makes you happy in some way. Notice that the word happy is never used in HD's poem, but you definitely get the sense that the mood of the poem is one of joy, celebration, yay, summer is here, and all the tree, the tree is like blooming out, and that lets me know that I should be a happy person. Of course, the quality of a great poem is that it changes the way you see simple things. Maybe the next time you look at a tree, you'll remember HD's celebration of the pear tree her Imagist offering. Thank you very much.